Well, hello everybody. Can you hear me okay uh, in the back? Welcome to the uh, meeting tonight uh, to talk about a subject that has been a point of conversation for well over 30 years here in St. Louis Park, the, the property uh, known as the Riley Tar uh, and Chemical Corporation site. Um, uh, that's also, that was also one of the first Superfund sites here uh, in the country. Um, we're really happy to be here because we've got some great things to talk about in terms of what's happened over the last 30 years with the site. And um, we now want to talk about, uh, in addition, what's going to be happening for the next 30 years uh, related to the site. Uh, to help me with the conversation tonight, there are several people in attendance, including Mark Hansen, our uh, uh, operations superintendent. David Zoll is our attorney uh, who has been helping uh, us uh, uh, with uh, the process of working with our agencies. And then Nabil Fayumi, uh, who is with the Environmental Protection Agency, who we have worked closely through this um, whole process now for several years. I also have a bevy of other um, staff in attendance and consultants and uh, also representatives, other representatives from the Environmental Protection Agency, the Minnesota Department of Health, and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And they're going to be here uh, to help answer questions as well, either during the presentation or afterwards, uh, if you'd like to meet with them directly and just talk more deeply about uh, a particular issue that you might be concerned about. Now, I know there's some people in the room that haven't necessarily lived here that long, but I'm just going to ask this question anyway. Who, uh, who was around in 1986? Anybody? Okay, some of you are, some of you are. Jim, of course, I know you were, and Phyllis. Um, or who has heard about the Riley Tar site, the Riley Superfund site, something that is associated with Riley? Bunch of you have? Okay, that's great. Well, we're gonna talk about that tonight. You're gonna get, I think, a great presentation uh, from our, our staff and consultants on that. Um, uh, in a nutshell, there was a, uh, a uh, industry on the 80-acre property pretty much located just northwest of what's now Walker Street and Louisiana Avenue. Um, they, uh, among other things, um, undertook an operation where they uh, preserved uh, railroad ties uh, that were used to build our railroad infrastructure here in the United States. They operated from about 1917 to about 1972. Um, and after that, um, uh, after a discovery was made about some pollution that occurred as a result of their operation, a number of, of uh, measures were taken, a number of actions were taken, um, including the agencies from here in Minnesota and also the Environmental Protection Agency to start addressing the pollution that occurred uh, as a result of that particular business. That resulted in a pretty important document uh, being put in place in 1986, over 30 years ago, um, that uh, was signed off and approved by the EPA, uh, the city, Riley, and other um, uh, property owners or governmental entities that laid out roles and responsibilities for mitigating the contamination that occurred on the site, whether it be in the ground or in the groundwater um, uh, underneath, uh, underneath the ground, of course, and the groundwater that we would use for uh, drinking water here in St. Louis Park. Um, so that consent decree had a, 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 a term, if you will, or a life of 30 years. Um, that 30 years uh, um, uh, came up in, 19, or in 2016, and we have been working with the agencies I think in close partnership, actually since about 2013, I believe, on uh, putting in place the next consent decree or a consent decree for the next 30 years. Um, even though the consent decree technically, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know if the word to use is expired, uh, all of the requirements under that consent decree um, are still um, uh, need to be met and we as a city are obligated to meet all of those requirements. So no worries there. Uh, back in 1986, actually in the early 1980s, we had two people um, who worked for the city uh, who did incredible um, work in terms of 
of uh, grappling with this pollution that occurred on the site and finding a way to address it that would um, make the site safe and ensure that our drinking water was, was safe as well. And so in attendance is Phyllis McQuaid. Phyllis uh, was the mayor uh, in the late 1970s and early 1980s and took trips to Washington and did all sorts of things to look out for the city's interests uh, 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 to make sure that things were done properly for our community. And then Jim Brimmeyer is in attendance. Jim was the city manager. I think he started in 1980, Jim, and, and worked for the city uh, till, almost 19, till almost 1990. Uh, and he was uh, extremely uh, influential in terms of working with the agencies on getting the consent decree in place. So I'd like to ask Jim just to come up and talk for a couple of minutes about his experience with the Riley site and then his observations about the new amended consent decree that we're going to talk about a little later this, this evening. Yes, please. When he talked, or Cindy actually called me about doing this, and um, I thought, you know, that's a long time ago, and I'm not, I don't have the memory I used to have, as some of you get older, you'll recognize that. So I thought, well, I should do a little research, and, and I don't know why, I'm not sure why this is the case, but I was looking for something else, and I saw this file that said Riley, and I pulled it out, and I had this newspaper from 1982. It's got a little frayed around the edges and it's lost its color, but it's when we were back working as the number one Superfund site in the country and getting Superfund funds to help clean this up. And we were front page, not only on this paper, but the Star Tribune and even the Pioneer Press, I think for about as long as I can remember during that period of time. I also found this. This is the original draft of the consent decree settling all this and attached to it is the remedial action plan that they worked with for 30 years. So Tom asked me to be brief, so for me to do that, I had to make some notes. The history of the site is kind of interesting. It started way back in the early 1900s and it's, I noticed it's back there on that board. So I'm not going to get too deeply into that. I was planning on doing that, but the board covers it way better than I can. My history with it, though, is a little more interesting. I started, Phyllis McQuaid was the mayor. Phyllis and Lyle called me on my way back from here to Chicago saying, we're going to hire you tonight. When can you start? I said, okay, I'll be there in July. Started in July of 1980, and in September of 1980, we closed five wells. Shortly thereafter, we were in, either in the process or got sued by federal EPA, federal justice, state EPA, state health, state attorney general, and Riley. And then they countersued us. And I just need to share this with you is when we would negotiate some sort of an, try to negotiate some sort of an agreement, there would be like 13, 14 people in the room. It would be myself, the city manager, and Carl Lusher, representing Riley Tar and Chemical. The rest of them were attorneys representing the different agencies. I don't know how to describe that scene now, but it wouldn't be any, wouldn't be any prettier today than it was ugly then. So we had, super, we were the number one Superfund site in the country, and a lot of people forget this, across the street was the Babe Golden Auto Parts, Anybody remember that, which used to be a battery manufacturing plant? When we redid Highway 7 in Louisiana, when we dug down there and did the base for it, it was nothing but white chalky dirt from all that battery acid that was dumped down there. That site was almost as bad as this one. During all of these negotiations, we had incidents that didn't help us very well. We had a fire at the Sheraton, now the Doubletree, and our then water superintendent, now gone, didn't think we had enough water pressure, so we opened five of the wells. And the next day, Dick Coppy, who was the director of public works, came up and said, I gotta tell you something. We opened five of the wells last night to fight the fire. I said, okay, we better get something done. That was just one of many incidents, I think. Am I not close enough to this? 
Because I think, Phyllis may remember this, we must have had a press conference about every other week, her, myself, and Dick Coppy explaining what was going on, because it was always something we were in the paper for. It was politically charged locally, statewide, and nationally. Um, we made, I don't know how many trips to Washington, in fact, one of them is spoken about in this paper, meeting with Bill Frenzel, anybody remember him? And I can't remember who our senator was then, our U.S. senator back in 1981, 82, 83, trying to get Superfund money. Um, we had a special master assigned to us. Our judge was Paul Magnuson. He appointed Crane Winton as special master. Some of you may remember that name. Special master is there to help the parties come to a conclusion to bring back to the judge so the judge can make a ruling on it. And here I need to add an anecdotal story. Many years after this, a friend of ours had um, a son get married, and they got married in the caves in St. Paul. Bob Schaefer, who used to be city manager in Ingrove Grove Heights, worked for us at the Brimmeyer Group. And so I got assigned to the table with this guy. And I said, what do you do? He says, I'm a judge. I'm Paul Magnuson. I said, oh, really? I said, really? I'm curious. What's the most interesting case you've ever had? He said, you know, we had this case in St. Louis Park. And I said, what? I said, was it water? He said, yes. I said, you were the judge on that case? He said, yes. I said, what did you think of it? He said, I always knew it would never go to trial. I always knew it would be settled on the courthouse steps. And indeed it was. It was settled on the courthouse steps. So what kind of brought us to where we are today? I don't know. I don't know when this was. We started this whole fiasco in, in September of 1980. It had to be about 1984, 85. We're sitting in the conference room with the EPA and the PCA folks, and I said, look, give me some concept of how bad polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons are, or a carcinogen. And they, and I, they said, well, if you drank two eight-ounce glasses of water every day and lived to be 80, you'd have one in 100,000 chances of getting cancer. I said, you got to repeat that. So they did. I said, I think I can walk out here on Minnetonka Boulevard and stand there for 20 minutes and pick up the carbon dioxide and pick up as much carcinogens as you're talking about in the water. And they said, yeah, you might be right. I said, well, what's an acceptable standard then? And they said, zero. I said, so you're telling me we're working with zero PAHs in our drinking water? They said, yeah. I said, that's impossible. So we were kind of behind the eight ball. No, we were behind the eight ball, not kind of. We were behind the eight ball. And so it was with that guideline in mind that we negotiated the remedial action plan. And that's all covered here in the dissent decree, which you have no interest in hearing about tonight, and you probably will later, about who was responsible for what, for testing the water. We, were, we started testing the water even when they opened the, the wells for the fire. We, st we were testing water all the time. And we were always assured we had sprinkling. In fact, the paper back in 82, city imposes sprinkling ban. We were doing it a long time ago. It's not new. So the, re the remedial action plan was done. I know it's been done at considerable cost. I've heard from my fellow council members that call me to talk to me say, you know, you really cost us a lot of money over the years. I said, maybe, but it's all we had to do at the time because the, the criteria was zero. We spent a lot of money doing that. So when Tom told me they were talking about a new remedial action plan, he said, now they have standards that they can live with. And I don't know what they are. You'll get to that, I'm sure. Well, thank goodness. That remedial action plan has worked for, since 1986, what is that, 32 years, right? It's worked for 32 years. And I suspect this one is going to be even better. And that's why I really think it's great that you got to this point. Uh, I have a lot more stories to share, but Tom said stifle it, so I'm not going to share those stories. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I can't underscore enough how uh, difficult it was back in the early 80s amongst all of the agencies in terms of um, how to address what was found on that site. So they were... Uh, uh, working a little bit in the dark, and the standards that they came up with uh, were rigid, but in the end uh, did work. And I think you're going to hear a little bit later the fact that the 
consent decree and the remedial action plan that was put in place back in 1986 has been a success. And Mark will touch on that just a little bit and Nabil may as well. So I think we deserve, I think uh, Jim and Phyllis deserve a great uh, deal of thanks for um, all of the energies and effort they put into this. And I think the agencies also deserve a lot of thanks uh, for making sure that our community and its drinking water was, was kept safe. Um, so the structure of the meeting tonight is this. Uh, uh, Mark is gonna talk a little bit about the history of, a little bit more about the history of the site, uh, show a few slides. Uh, then Nabil is gonna come up and talk with this, with all of us a little bit about the agency's role in this, which has been ex incredibly important. Um, and then, uh, David Zoll, uh, our attorney with Lockridge Grindle, is gonna talk about some of the specifics of the new consent decree, uh, so you can understand that. Uh, and then after that, uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. Uh, the one thing I would note about the questions is we are being broadcast live tonight. So we're, we're streaming out there on our uh, cable channel and on our, off of our website. So Jackie is gonna be walking around with a mic uh, so that when you have a question, you can certainly ask it. Uh, all, that, all that we ask is that you speak into the mic and then I'll kind of play traffic cop a little bit in terms of who I think might be best to answer that question. So that's, that's kind of how we're gonna go and hopefully we can get to your questions here um, quickly. So Mark, do you wanna take it from here? And My pleasure. So again, um, my name is Mark Hansen. I am the city's public works uh, superintendent and I want to thank all of you in the audience for taking the time to get here tonight and participate in this meeting. Um, having driven here in what is normally a five minute drive from our municipal service center that took almost 20 minutes, um, it, I know it was an arduous task to come join us. So thank you for doing that and for those that may be watching at home, um, you were very wise to do so and I hope you are enjoying your popcorn as you watch us on TV. So what I would like to do, as Tom said, is, is take you through a little bit of the Riley site. And really we gotta start with, um, as <clears throat> Mr. Burmeyer had alluded to, so what was the problem? Uh, the problem was, and I have a slide up here that has a lot, lot of verbiage, but really what I'm gonna do is describe that verbiage as I now show a picture of the site as it was almost 100 years ago. So what happened is you have, up here is where they used to actually refine creosote. So it was a creosote manufacturing plant. Then they would pump the creosote over to this building where they would do the treatment of all the timbers that you see here on the site. And between the manufacturing process, the treatment process, and then after the wood was treated, it was left to store out in the open where the weather, precipitation, snowfall, you know, whatnot, um, would pretty much rinse off any remaining uh, creosote treatment that didn't rinse off in the treatment building. So all of that stuff found its way onto the ground. Now, Remember, this is back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, where people didn't understand the impact to the environment. That was kind of the status quo of how industrial sites were run. When they looked at a leaking pipe, they didn't look at it as an impact to the environment. They really looked at it as a slight loss of efficiency in their operation. And over the course of time, what happened is those materials would percolate down into the soil and contaminate the soil. Then a lot of people don't understand is prior to this site being run by Riley, it was a sugar beet manufacturing or sugar beet processing plant. And that plant required a lot of wells uh, for their process to, you know, to pump water for their process. And those wells, when the site transferred over to Riley, were kind of forgotten about and abandoned. And those wells allowed the contaminant that went from the surface percolating into the ground to all of a sudden get into the groundwater. So now not only do we have the surface or the, the soil itself contaminated, but we also have our groundwater contaminated. 
So as Mr. Brimmeyer uh, very accurately described, that resulted in a lot of taste and odor issues that then created a lot of concern um, by the health agencies and the Environmental Protection Agency and a lot of lawsuits happening. So they had to come up with a means of resolving all those legal issues. And that was the 1986 consent decree. And generally speaking, what that consent decree did for us is it settled the lawsuits. Those that were a party to the lawsuits became a party to the consent decree. Um, it also had Riley build uh, or install some of the necessary treatment to handle the contaminants that were in the water. So the slide up here shows uh, the GAC treatment, which is granular activated carbon. That is the acceptable treatment for handling those PAHs, uh, or the contaminant in the water, and a million dollars of contingency. Well, that million dollars of contingency was right away eaten up to install granular treatment in a second plant. So we actually have two of our water plants that were built with the water treatment, our drinking water plants, and a third plant was equipped with that granular activated carbon to just handle what's called gradient control in the upper aquifers. So to take a quick step back, that contaminants that percolated into the groundwater created what's called a plume. Similar to if you drop a stone in water, you see the ripple effect of that stone. Well, as those contaminants hit the groundwater, it sort of kind of created its own ripple effect. And it would grow larger, not so much, so it would, as it grew larger, it got a little bit less in terms of the severity of the contamination, but it was still growing. So one of the things that was resolved by adding these treatment to our water plants was a means of what's called gradient control, or a means to control that contaminant plume. So we would pump the water, treat it to make it safe for consumption as drinking water, and then feed it through our distribution system. So that does two great things for us. One, it contains the plume to keep it from traveling any further. And two, it avoids just dumping it or wasting it into the environment um, by being able to put it through our distribution system and, and consume as clean, safe drinking water. Um, so again, back to that consent decree, Riley assisted in building those plants financially. The city was responsible for uh, running the operations and the monitoring of, of the site. And then, uh, as again, as Mr. Brimmeyer alluded to, what we did was kind of best guess in terms of what standards to use. You know, he talked about, you know, zero. So there were other standards that were really best guesses at the time. And, and I've heard in others, uh, it was described as kind of like a, a blunt instrument because the science and the technology at the time really didn't allow for highly uh, accurate standards associated with health impacts 30 years ago. So they did the best they could with the information they had at the time. What that resulted in in terms of the city as a responsible uh, water producer is that at modern times it's about half a million dollars a year to run that, that treatment plant um, or that treatment process and all the sampling and monitoring that goes along with it. So naturally after 30 years the city had an interest in working with our agency partners to say, hey, we've been at this for 30 years, we've learned a lot, science and technology has come a long way, let's go ahead and take a fresh look at the site. And that process that started in 2013, as Tom alluded to, uh, is where we're at today as we've worked our way through the various milestones to come here today. So the results of that, uh, again, uh, Tom and Mr. Brimmer and I heard alluded to the fact that um, we all have our roles in this process. So uh, the various agencies that are here in support of, of uh, this meeting tonight and help you answer some of the questions you may ask. Uh, the EPA, their role in the process is to ensure compliance with that consent decree and any legal records of, de of uh, decision that came about of the 86 consent decree. The MPCA's role, generally speaking, is to make sure that we're doing adequate operations and monitoring to make sure the plume is contained. The Department of Health, their role 
in all of this is to make sure that we produce clean, safe drinking water through monitoring and testing. And then lastly, again, our role is to run the system, do the maintenance on it, do the appropriate updates to make sure that we continue to produce that clean, safe drinking water. The neat part is even though um, it's, it's, it's been going on for 30 years and the expense has crept up over the years, literally back in 1986, it was expected to be about $20,000 a year. And, you know, as Jim said, uh, why did the city ever agree to it for various reasons? One of the reasons cost was expected to be about 20,000. It's ballooned up to 500,000. But the greatest part is it's been a success. And this is where I'm so proud to be able to stand up in front of you and help articulate that success. And to really do that, I'll, I'll take a personal step aside. So I coach, I have five kids. I've coached them all through hockey. And as a hockey coach in youth hockey, one of the things we try to do as coaches is what's called transformational coaching instead of transactional coaching. Transactional coaching means you coach the kids to win. That's all you care about is winning. Transformational coaching is you make the kids better human beings. You teach them about leadership. You teach them about sportsmanship, about winning and losing, about adversity and how to overcome it, all those things that make lives better for these kids, transform their lives. So to illustrate just how successful the last 30 years have been, I'll offer the following pictures. The physical transformation of the site, from a heavy industrial site to what is undeniably a beautiful park. Again, of my five kids, three of them have been out on that park playing soccer games. I mean, it's, it's just a gorgeous. Excuse me, it's a gorgeous park and a wonderful opportunity to just stroll through the trail system in addition to using the athletic fields. The um, transformation of the users of the site. So instead of a site that's populated by rail cars and treated lumber and oil silos, you go out to that site now, you see a bunch of smiling, happy kids running around whether they're participating in a recreational program activity or they're participating in an athletic event, um, that's what you see. A bunch of smiling little kids having a great time out there. Again, just it's a wonderful transformation. Third, transformation of the quality of the water that's coming out of that site. So literally, back in the 70s, that is a well. That's a water well. Not a drinking water well, but it was a well used um, for monitoring purposes. And before a well can be monitored, it has to be pumped so that it gets um, to a consistent flow so we understand that it's, 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 a, it's a sample that would be consistent to what is actually in the ground. So we pump it out to clear what's in the pipes to make sure that we're sampling water that's from the ground, not water that was sitting in the pipes. So that water through the course of all of the efforts that we have done from a drinking water perspective, a treatment, uh, treatment of the drinking water is now um, wonderfully tasting, um, clean, safe drinking water. And as proof of that, and unfortunately, the uh, teleprompter covers um, my validity statement, which is we were one of 22 uh, city municipal water systems that participated in the 2017 Minnesota State Fair's uh, water taste competition, and we took third. So that's how far our water has come. We took third of 22 municipal cities in the metro area that participated in the taste test. So again, we've transformed, um, it's a transformation of the quality of the water coming out of that site. And it's very, very exciting um, and rewarding to be a part of that. But. Honestly, we can't rest on our laurels. Uh, the meeting tonight is associated with the renewal of that consent decree. And yes, it's taken quite a while. We've been working on it since 2013 because it's that important, which is why it's great to see the participation here at the meeting is that you recognize the importance of it as well. Because it's an opportunity to renew it, we have a lot of opportunities associated with that. One of which is to look at the modern health standards that are available today. Obviously, over the last 30 years, science and technology in the medical field have come a long, long way. So this gives us an opportunity 
to look at what is the appropriate health impacts and what is the appropriate standards to associate with those health impacts and use those in the consent decree. Um, and that's what we're going to do. Um, update the groundwater modeling. Similar uh, computers, right? 30 years ago, computer couldn't do much for modeling efforts. Today, we can do modern things with modeling. So now we have a much more accurate, instead of we think the water is doing this uh, under the surface, now we have a pretty solid, high confident um, depiction of what's happening subsurface. So we know the impacts of our wells and what they're doing with the groundwater in terms of containing that plume. So we have an opportunity to update the, mo the, the modeling of the site. And lastly, we have an opportunity to update the consent decree itself, that document itself. Uh, back in 1986, all of the requirements were in the document itself. That document, as Mr. Brimmeyer had said, went in front of a U.S. federal court judge uh, in order to change anything, to be adopted. And then to change anything, it would have had to go back. The 30-year renewal has to go back. But the modern template allows a lot of the requirements to go into plans specific to the aquifer that it affects. So now the plans can be updated as modern science continues to change what we're concerned about. Now we can up those, update those plans separate from the consent decree itself um, and be much more fluid, much more adaptive to future changes, which again is an exciting thing to be a part of. Uh, recent planning efforts, obviously, as you see with the agencies in the room supporting us, we have great partnerships with our fellow agencies. Um, one of the first things we did was try to figure out what's the timeline. It's not very often that these large Superfund sites come forward uh, on, a, on a renewal of their consent decree. So we had to do a lot of planning on what are the steps associated with this process. Um, to do that as efficiently and as effectively as possible, we broke our team up into two parts. We had a legal team that was responsible for understanding the process, and then we had a technical team that was responsible for understanding what the new requirements of the consent decree should be. And then of course, and I can't foot stomp on this enough, that from the very beginning, both as the partnerships with the fellow, federal, fellow agencies and within our own council here in St. Louis Park, we have always maintained the focus is on the environment and making sure we provide clean, safe drinking water um, and we ensure always, you know, safety of our residents, our business owners um, within St. Louis Park. Uh, can't stress that enough. So uh, I'm very happy to see how far we've come over the, uh, the last 30 years. And um, at this time, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, my counterpart with the EPA, Mr. Nabil Fayumi, uh, who's the EPA, uh, EPA program manager for the site, to share his perspective on uh, looking forward. Well, my name is uh, Nabil Fayumi. Uh, Welcome here on a snowy night. I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, I'm with the US EPA and I'm with the Superfund Division. Uh, Superfund Division is responsible for managing cleanups at the hazardous waste site. Uh, some cleanups are conducted by the government, paid for by taxpayers. Other cleanups is conducted by uh, various entities, uh, the industry, the city, like in this particular case and the EPA role and responsibility is overseeing that cleanup to make sure it's done according to our, our regulations. I have been involved with this project since 2015. Uh, I don't have many, pro I haven't seen many projects where we have a consent decree that's 30 years old and it's up for renewal, so it's been uh, a unique case for me and I have been doing environmental work for 25 years, so it shows you the amount of work and effort that went to into this site from the beginning. As we said earlier, it's, we are updating uh, the legal document, which is the consent decree, but we're also updating the uh, remedial action plan. The RAB, the RAB is the technical document that kind of highlight all the work that needs to be done and document the way that needs to be done and who's responsible uh, for, for doing what. Uh, I just want to 
uh, highlight that this consent decree expired in 2016. We have been working on it since 2013 to renew it. And I would like to give the city some credit uh, by agreeing to operate the system as is while we are negotiating the consent decree. So that was very helpful from the city to agree to do that, to give us some time to negotiate a new consent decree that's better than the old one and it's for us to continue the work going forward. Um, so EPA really supports the process of renewing the consent decree along with all our partners and it has been a, quite an exercise but when it's all said and done I think the city will benefit from it and I think we'll be negotiating a better consent decree than what we have already in place. And nothing will change. The EPA and the state will continue to oversee the cleanups to ensure that's done in a way that's protective to human health and the environment. So this is a vital role for us, for the EPA, but also for, for the state as well. So during this presentation, I would like to highlight. Can go back? Yes, please. Uh, I would like to highlight a few things that we've done over the last 30 years. Again, our the core mission for the US EPA is the protection of human health and the environment. And at this particular site, we have been doing so since 1986. Uh, we provided. Uh, acceptable uh, drinking water standard to the community. Uh, we prevented exposure to site contaminants, but we also contained the spread of the groundwater plume. And those three activities are still ongoing. Uh, you know, it's, this, is, this is the work that we will continue to focus on during the, the, the next uh, consent decree. The EPA's goal is to return most of our Superfund site to reusable, uh, uh, beneficial reuse property. So this is, this is our goal usually. Uh, we start with these contaminated properties and then eventually, hopefully, we could turn them to the community where they could redevelop them, uh, reuse them, and make, uh, put them to good use. So this, is, this site is, is a classic case for that. Uh, but this is a common thing that we do. This is, this is our goal, to return these sites to beneficial use. Uh, so EPA and the city and the state have been uh, supportive of this process. And especially the city, uh, you know, they, they provide a strong commitment to the development. And usually developing a site to beneficial use, you have to jump quite a few hurdles. And I think the city commitment to investing uh, resources and turning this property to uh, the property that became, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty important. And I, again, would like to acknowledge uh, all the work that the city did and along with the, with the state as well. So we've seen pictures of how the site looked back in 1983. And back in 1983 is when the EPA ranked the site. We have what we call a national priority list. This is a list where the sites are rated and the sites that score the highest, these are the most polluted sites that gets federal funding and gets attention from the government and various stakeholders to have it cleaned up. Uh, the site scored high in 1983, and as you've seen some of these pictures, it looked pretty, pretty bad back then. And you've seen pictures how it looks right now. Now you have an area that's vegetated, that's a nice park, you have an athletic field, you have a multiple family housing, and then you have an, you know, other commercial area as well. Some of the work that we've done at the site, we covered the site uh, with you know, clean, clean soil to make sure that there is no exposure to, exposure to contaminated soil. And then also over the years, the city did a lot of construction work in the area and in the park itself. So over time, the city brought in additional clean fill and then placed it on top of the uh, contaminated covered soil as well. So, this issue came up 
quite a few times during the last public meeting I have, so I want to touch up on it again. We have a soil cover throughout the whole site, a clean soil cover that ranged anywhere from three inches to three feet. So most of the site is pretty capped and it's pretty contained. We also conducted a vapor intrusion study. This is a study to kind of determine if there's any exposure related to all these gases that are coming from soil and from groundwater. And when we did that, we kind of looked at the worst case scenario. If there was an issue, we should have been able to, to detect it or see it. And EPA concluded there was no unacceptable risk at the site. And again, this is an issue that the community inquired about last time we came out for a public meeting and I wanted to touch up on that as well. We've done four rounds of sampling and we've done extensive work between 2011 and 2013 and we found out that there is no unacceptable risk at the site. Uh, by law we are required to do five-year reviews on this particular site and any other site in the, in the nation where we leave contamination buried or in place. This is one of the sites that meet that requirement. So we are required by the law to come on out and do an extensive evaluation every five years. We do evaluate the site extensively every year. The city does monitoring and sample collection every month. Uh, they submit a report to us annually and uh, Every five, on top of that, every five, year review, every five years, we need to come in out and do an extensive review. And up to this point, we conducted five reviews, and all reviews documented that the remedy is working, and it's acceptable, and there is no concerns that the community need to worry about. Also, these reviews will identify issues and recommendations, how we could do things better as well. So, again, here's my inf contact information if you guys need anything. We also have a web page that you guys could, could go on. There's some uh, relevant documents. We have a community involvement plan. Uh, you'll find uh, contact information, people you could call and ask any questions you may have. I'm David Zoll uh, with the law firm Lockridge Grindle Nowen, and as Tom mentioned, uh, the city brought us in in 2013 uh, to assist with the process of updating and renewing uh, the consent decree as that 30-year anniversary was approaching. Uh, a lot has been said about the history of the site and, and some about what the, the new consent decree is going to look like. I want to briefly address that, but uh, then I want to address uh, the process, uh, what, what happens from today going forward uh, with respect to the amended consent decree. Uh, the, the consent decree uh, in 1986 was entered as uh, essentially a settlement agreement uh, for the litigation that ensued uh, related to the Riley site. Uh, so the parties to that consent decree, uh, the city, EPA, uh, the Pollution Control Agency and Department of Health here in Minnesota, and, and some private entities uh, are the parties that were involved in those lawsuits. Uh, and as a way to resolve it, they, they brought this agreement to federal court and said, Here, here's how we're going to address this site. Uh, these are the roles and responsibilities going forward. These are the standards that are going to apply. Uh, and it was approved by uh, Judge Paul Magnuson. Uh, and that has been the document that's been controlling this site uh, for the past 30 years. Uh, as that 30-year anniversary was approaching, uh, we, uh, the city and, and the agencies, uh, took the opportunity to basically take a step back. Uh, as was mentioned, this was one of the first Superfund sites uh, in Minnesota, or not in Minnesota, in, in the nation. Uh, and one of the first to have a consent decree like this that, that would be governing it. Uh, and we wanted to take a step back and evaluate if this were a new site, if we were coming it to, to it today, how would we be addressing it? What would the remedy look like? What would the consent decree look like? And that's really been the effort that's occurred from 2013 forward. Uh, Mark had mentioned that there was a technical team uh, and a legal team. The technical team did the work of evaluating what would the remedy look like? 
how should the groundwater uh, containment continue to operate going forward? Uh, the legal team looked at what should, how, how should the consent decree be structured? Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna talk briefly about that structure. Uh, in the intervening 30 years, uh, since 1986, the US Department of Justice has developed a model uh, consent decree for sites like this, uh, and it's been updated over the years. And we started with that model. Uh, so what, what will be governing the Riley site is gonna be consistent with what's governing other sites like it uh, across the United States. But we made some adaptations. Uh, a lot of these sites involve a company like Riley, who is the owner uh, and therefore the, the subject of the consent decree. We're in a different scenario. Uh, the, the city owns the property, uh, and we made sure that the, the consent decree acknowledges that and recognizes that there is more of a partnership because we have the city on the one hand and the state and the EPA on the other, and we wanted to make sure that it was structured in a way that reflected that. Um, I could get into the details of how that works, but it, it's more in the, the, uh, the nitty gritty details, but it acknowledges that, that relationship and that cooperative relationship that we've had over the years. There's two key things um, also that the consent decree does that, that Mark mentioned, but I just wanna highlight those. The first is it incorporates the, the modern uh, drinking water and health standards that have been uh, approved for the, the contaminants at issue here. And it not only incorporates those standards that apply today, it automatically incorporates updated standards uh, going forward. So if the Department of Health uh, promulgates new standards uh, for one of the substances that, that we're concerned about with the Riley site, those automatically become controlling for the Riley site. There's no need to go back and reopen the consent decree to update the standards. So we're always gonna be operating this site with our eye on what is the, the current standards that, that apply for these uh, substances. The other important thing that it does that, that Mark also mentioned is uh, it allows for more flexibility in terms of the remedy. And, and the easiest way for me to explain what that means uh, in, in the day-to-day -day operations is the, the existing consent decree has, for some wells, it specifies a certain pumping rate. You have to pump this well at this rate, uh, and if we want to change that, we need to go back to the federal court and have that changed. The new consent decree, the, the proposed consent decree, allows operational changes like that to be made, uh, the, the city can propose it, and then it's approved by EPA and MPCA. Uh, maybe they disagree and, and say, you know, instead of pumping at this rate, uh, we think it should be here, but we can negotiate that, have that flexibility, uh, and with the oversight of the agencies, can tailor the system to match the existing conditions. So as the monitoring continues, there's the flexibility to be able to tailor the remedy to match what, what's actually happening, what the data is showing would be the most effective way to address it. So those are probably the, the two uh, biggest changes operationally in the consent decree. Uh, I'll talk very briefly about what happens uh, going forward. Uh, the consent decree does need to be approved ultimately by uh, the federal court, and before it gets there, uh, all the parties to the consent decree uh, will, will sign off on it and file it uh, with a federal court for approval. Um, you've heard the not name uh, Judge Paul Magnuson several times tonight, um, and one of the reasons you hear that is Judge Magnuson is still on the bench uh, in, in federal court in St. Paul, uh, is, is on senior status but has an active docket. This case in all likelihood is gonna go right back to, to Paul Magnuson, uh, who is gonna have the opportunity to review the amended consent decree. Uh, hopefully this is still the most interesting case that he's had, uh, but for reasons of what has happened in the intervening 30 years and the success stories that, that Mark highlighted. Uh, it will go back to Judge Magnuson for approval. Before he can approve the consent decree, however, there will be an opportunity uh, a 30-day public comment period uh, for the public to review and provide input on the consent decree. And ultimately, uh, the, the Judge Magnuson uh, will take that public input into consideration and decide whether uh, to enter the consent decree as proposed or if there's modifications that need to be made. But that's the process going forward. Uh, there, there's still some work that needs to be done uh, in terms of fine-tuning everything before it's ready to be approved and submitted to the court but we're on track, and by on track, I, I, I would 
I always hate in public to venture a guess in terms of timeline, but we're probably talking about in the next three to six months that, that everything will be ready uh, to be submitted to the court to have the public comment period uh, and then ultimately move forward with it. So that's uh, the, the consent decree, the amended consent decree that we've been working on for the last five years, um, and, and I'll echo what everyone else has said. Uh, from my perspective as the lawyer, uh, the work by the city, by the MPCA and the Department of Health and EPA uh, to come together and take a fresh look at this site and figure out what is the most effective way to protect human health and the environment going forward and to have a real collaborative approach in terms of redeveloping the remedial action plan, the consent decree. Uh, it's been great. Um, lawyers like confrontation. It, it's where uh, we thrive. Uh, and this has not been that situation. Uh, so I, I've enjoyed it. It's been a refreshing break uh, from, from situation where there's a lot of confrontation. I appreciate all the work uh, that's been done getting it to this point. And I'll turn it back to Tom, uh, who will uh, field questions and, and play traffic cop. Please. I will. I'll try to play traffic cop. Uh, just to piggyback on something David said, um, we are not in the 30-day comment period. We wanted to, to uh, engage with the community on the proposed amended consent decree well before that. Um, and that's what this conversation is about tonight and uh, conversations that we might continue to have in the future. Um, <clears throat> so I think what I'll do is just, and I know there's some people who have questions because they've raised their hands already. Jackie, if you could, um, if you could, uh, if. Who has questions? And if Jackie will come to you and you can ask your question and then I'll direct them to the, to the correct person. There you go. I knew I had one. Um, as someone new to this process and everything that's going on where I live. Um, I was wondering if somebody could help me understand the pumping wells, the water containment. Um, so there is contaminated water. Where does that go? Mm -hmm. Do, does someone ultimately end up drinking that? So, um, you know, we were talking about the, the GAC um, pumping wells. I was curious, where are those located, and where's the water containment? And I guess I'm just curious, what what does that look like to someone who has no knowledge of that? Great question. I'll have uh, Mark Hansen, our uh, Public Works Operations Superintendent, speak to that. And um, I also, uh, uh, if possible, if or if we need to, bring up a representative of the Minnesota Department of Health, who really. Um, is the third party that makes sure that the water we are providing our, our community is safe to drink. So that way we're not, we're not saying it's safe to drink, although it is, but we also have another party uh, who's a regulator that will say that it's safe to drink. But I'll let Mark go first. Okay, so assuming I still have control, I will, Ooh, not all the colors showed up on this. Um, so I won't confuse you with that. We'll go back to the front slide. So the way it works is, <clears throat> so the contaminants were originally above ground, and they slowly worked their way more or less vertically downward in terms of the, the, the site outline. Um, they made their way vertically downward, got into the groundwater. Now, if you envision that uh, ripple effect, like dropping the stone in the water, once it gets into the groundwater, it's going to expand. Um, so the concept of gradient control is to control subsurface in the groundwater table to control how far you allow it to expand such that it doesn't expand past our city borders. That's our goal in working with both operationally with, with our operations crew and with the agencies that are, you know, look at the monitoring reports that we provide. We are all working collectively to make sure that the gradient control system or the concept of preventing the plume from expanding is working. The way we do that is we have um, wells 10 and 15, which is at treatment plant one, which is north of Minnetonka um, by uh, Idaho and Jersey. And we also have uh, treatment plant four, 
that is over by Susan Langren School toward the southeast that pump a lot of water, literally 1,500, 1,500 gallons per minute is what is pulled out of the ground for purposes of not letting the plume expand past uh, those two sites, so to speak. And, and really what it's doing at, at that rate of pumping is it's pulling the water even all around it. It's just sucking it up and bringing it up to the surface so that within our plants, we can treat the water and pull out all those contaminants in what's called that granular activated carbon, um, which quite honestly, if you have a modern fridge that has a filter system in it, it's very similar technology. It's just on a much, much larger scale. Um, so we pull the water out of the ground through our pumps we push that water through the filtration system, and then we distribute it out into the system as clean, safe drinking water. And then as Tom had alluded to, we don't do that, you know, operate in a vacuum, so to speak, all on ourselves. That water is continually tested uh, by the Department of Health to make sure that it stays safe. Right. Sure, so... Um, so Jim's point was to discuss quickly the concept of how aquifers occur subsurface. So here's a slide that illustrates what I'm talking about. And I, I apologize for getting too technical uh, early. So thanks for catching that, Jim. Um, so these are the aquifers. Literally, this picture on the right um, is the seven county metropolitan area. That's how big the aquifers that we're talking about are subsurface. So if you think about it, let's say Riley existed up here next to this tree. The contaminants are going to slowly migrate downward and get into the aquifers here. Then if this were an active pumping well right here, we would really literally have a pump down on the bottom that pulls the water in and then pushes it vertically up the well shaft to where we would have a treatment plant that treats it as I described earlier. Does that, does that help answer your question? It does, thank you. I just have a question. So the plume that you refer to, is that like, could you think of it like a fence then that keeps it contained? Or I guess my question is like, how big is the contaminant area? And where is this plume you refer to? So I, I don't have a good, um, picture or illustration of the size of the plume. Um, it, it's, it's looking at the modeling, it, it's actually has shrunk over the years because of the, uh, the gradient control system. Um, I, I could defer to my MPCA colleagues. Do you, are you aware of a, a map of the plume or a better way to describe the size of the plume? So that's what this was supposed to show, but for whatever reason, during the transfer of the slide, the, the site doesn't show up, and the plume would have been very easy to describe uh, and related to the site. Um, so I apologize for that, not being prepared well enough to have that picture of the plume. I mean, is the plume just like in the Riley site area? Or? No, it does extend. Um, so. If I could, with a relatively steady hand. Um, so, well 23. Well 23 was the original Riley well. That was the well that provided water for the Riley site. So for purposes of your bearings, this is the Riley site. SLP 15 up here is water treatment plant one. That is the well that is produced and pushed through water treatment plant one. Here down in the southeast is water treatment plant four. So the plume is more or less captured within that area of, of those wells. Um, that is the job of those wells is the act, what's called active gradient control to pull sufficient water from the ground that the plume is not able to migrate uh, past those sites, if you will.
Any other questions? Jack? Uh, hi, I, my name is Beth Grossman. I currently live in San Francisco and I came to this meeting. I grew up in San, San Luis Park and was here all through college. And many of us are, were drinking water before 1980. I'm also a cancer survivor and there's a large group of us that have uh, identified a kind of cancer cluster, as well as I have many friends where entire families got cancer. So I'm just kind of wanted to find out what was happening before 1980, before they determined it was a Superfund site and started the process of uh, trying to contain the plume? Well, first off, I'm sorry to hear that uh, health issues have emerged from, uh, for you and for others and that you have to, have to become part of a cancer cluster group. I'm wondering, uh, either Mike, Mark might answer that or perhaps somebody from the Department of Health can talk a little bit about um, the studies I know that you've done on uh, concerns about cancers uh, as a result of the Riley uh, contamination. Is that the question you want to address right now? Because I think she's first asking what was going on at the site in the prior to the 80s. Well, with the water, I mean, was there any awareness? Mark, do you want to? Are you able to speak to that at all? So obviously I was not, I, not here in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> the site was, was pumped. Um, um, we had several wells that were active pumping wells back in those days. Um, and, and Mr. Brimeyer did allude to this in his, in his uh, presentation where as those sites were being pumped, as there became taste and odor concerns, what we did was um, shut them down. And so once they became a concern and it was validated through testing through the Department of Health, those wells were shut down and a new well was turned on. Um, so while we didn't have active filtration back then, what we did was just shut the well down and pump somewhere else that was delivering clean water and then sending that through the distribution system. Um, to, to get back a little bit to the, the nuts and bolts of a distribution system, um, to a very large degree, if you look at an, uh, Google Maps that show all of the city streets, there is a water main underneath virtually every city street. So all of our distribution piping is interconnected in what's called a looped system. So even though we had to shut down a pump at location X and turn on a pump at location Y that would have been further from the site and produce clean water, we can still push that clean water anywhere in the system through that interconnected looped system. So that's how uh, through the 70s and the 80s and um, when the water concerns started uh, coming up, that's how it was managed prior to the uh, active filtration system that we have today was installed. Um, I think, um Thanks, Mark. Maybe to your specific question, I think uh, your question was, uh, what was what was in the water before 1980 or 1986, right? Um, I don't have information right here that I can describe for you, but we weren't testing at that time for PAHs, as far as I know. In fact, we weren't aware necessarily that they might have existed. That all came about, I think, through an evolutionary process after uh, Riley shut down and, we, and uh, the agencies discovered and rediscovered what was going on. Um, so uh, were PAHs in the water in 1970 or 1980 um, before we knew about it? Possibly. Yes, possibly. Even further back, when did Riley start their operation? 1917. So, I think one um, could uh, assume that at some point in time, the groundwater was contaminated and, and um, was being used. Um, I don't know how far back that went. I don't know that anybody knows how far back that went. Um, what we do know is when it was discovered, um, measures were taken to, to deal with it, including shutting down a bunch of wells that the city had at the time. So. So um, I want to reiterate what Tom said about 
expressing sympathy for, for your health issues. It's always a, a personal tragedy and unfortunate. Um, I don't work in our cancer surveillance, surveillance area at the Department of Health, um, so I'm gonna speak for somebody else's work. And forgive me if I go astray. We have a lot of information on our web pages related to um, past studies that have been done looking specifically at cancer incidents and cancer um, mortality studies in St. Louis Park, trying to answer some of these questions about whether low level of pH is, some of which are cancer causing agents, um, in the water system could be associated with it any health outcomes in, in the cancer area. And a number of studies have been done over the years. The most recent one was a couple years ago. Um, I guess what I would say is it's best to read those stories or read those reports themselves. Um, I know that the last look, we were um, using our best available data, which is the Minnesota Cancer Surveillance System um, we were not able to find increased um, cancer incidents or different than the rest of the metro area rates of cancer deaths or mortality in the systems. That doesn't mean that somebody in St. Louis Park couldn't have cancer from conceivably something they were exposed to long ago, including the water system, but we don't have the ability with our current systems to define, to, to detect that. The systems just can't do that. So it's not like saying it didn't, it couldn't ever have happened. We just don't have the ability because the, the rate at which it, if it is happening, is not dramatically big enough that we would see it because cancer is a common occurrence, unfortunately, about one out of two people, you know, in this room or in our society is gonna encounter um, life-threatening cancer in our lifetimes. It's just really common. And so to find really small increases from something that we really didn't have a good handle on who was exposed, who wasn't, how much, over what time. We don't have a very good model of the exposure. And there's lots of other confounding and noise in that cancer data because cancer is so common and so many other things cause it as well. It's really hard to find something like that. So I guess I would really, if you're interested in that, refer you to our webpage. I know that the folks who um, do that work specifically and have updated this, um, their, their reports for looking at this particular community for these particular questions um, would be more than happy to speak to somebody on the phone or have an email conversation. They have even volunteered, they couldn't make it here tonight, but they have volunteered if there is interest in this community we will hold a meeting about that particular topic for people who are interested in St. Louis Park if there is a need for that. So that's what I think I'm comfortable saying right now. Um, I would refer you to the reports um, and, and encourage you to talk to our experts on that. Is that helpful? Um, so, I know that we can't do anything about what happened before we are, were aware of it, but I am concerned about what is going on now in terms of when he mentioned, you mentioned that there was a cap of anywhere from three inches to three feet of clean dirt, and that just doesn't seem like enough to me in terms of a kind of safety, and I know that they're monitoring and all that, but I just want to, you know, having like gone through the journey that I've gone through health-wise and growing up, I want to make sure that doesn't happen for future generations. And when I saw the pictures of the smiling kids out playing in the playground, it, it kind of broke my heart, to be honest, because I think that, you know, back in the day, we were really naive. And I hope that, you know, that we can really learn from that now and make sure we don't repeat this process. And I'm just, I'm also involved in San Francisco, in a, a major brownfield area too where they want to build 2200 houses and have kids playing and having gardens and all that and they all think it's fine and i i really think that we have to look at it deeply and what what is what it like that zero amount that they said before mm -hmm. is a good amount <laughs> you know and like i think and the other thing that made me worried was when they talked about now we have modern standards of what's acceptable and not acceptable. And, you know, it's really only what we kind of know now, but we don't know 
we really don't know how to look in the future. And I think that actually a lot of standards have even gotten looser, and particularly now with the EPA and, the, and what's going on with them. So I just, I'm, I'm here just as a kind of like, let's really look at this and be, and, um, and make sure that it is gonna be safe for future generations. Yeah, Bill, why don't you come on up? And Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, as far as the cab is concerned, EPA installed a cab early on, but over the years, the city did additional work and they brought in additional fill and they put it over the original cab that the EPA installed originally. Uh, and, and that effort is not well documented as far as how much soil went to where. I know we have areas where we have probably three feet of clean material, and I wanted to give you the worst case scenario. There's area probably where we ha only have three inches. Uh, we don't know how thick the cab throughout the whole uh, side is, and this is one of the areas that we are working on to go ahead and look at all the existing data to make sure we have an accurate picture of how thick the cab is throughout the site. Uh, the three inches, this is probably the worst case scenario, but I did not want to mislead the public and say the whole site is covered. We know for a fact that probably three inches is the thinnest portion, per thickness you may find, but I will not be surprised when it's all said and done based on the work that we've done over the years and based on the work that the city done over the years that we may have way more than just the three inches that I referenced to. Uh, as soon as the consent decree is signed, we have a schedule that's associated with it and one of the outstanding issues will be to draw an accurate picture of the existing cab of how much fill brought in, was brought in over the years and this is something we will share with the community. And I believe the schedule that's laid out in the consent decree is 90 days once the consent decree is signed, that map of the current cab based on historical data, sam soil samples and everything that we have will have a better, a better idea of how thick the cab is in each and every place. And as I said before, uh, this was one of the issues that was identified during our last five year review that we did. Mm -hmm. So this is an outstanding issue that we have to address where we need to come to the community and say, here's a map of the site and here's the various thickness throughout the site. Again, I just don't want to come out here and say, I know the whole site is covered with at least a foot to foot and a half soil. I want it to be on the conservative side until we have enough data to come back and show it to the community. Thank you, Nabil. Um, um, as Nabil pointed out, um, um, we're going to be required to do a, a basically an analysis of the entire, I believe, 80 acres in terms of determining what the cap is uh, on the site. Uh, Fortunately, a parking lot can serve as a cap, but we're talking really about vegetated areas. I think that's what you're speaking to as well. In terms of the park, we have a much greater understanding of, of what um, the cap is because we built that park or installed that park. Cindy, what was the year of that again? Early 2000s? Correct. So, um, and we had to go through the process of getting approval from the EPA and the PCA, all of the agencies, before we could disturb that site. Um, so we have a, we are, we're very confident about uh, the thickness of the cap, uh, especially where the playgrounds are and the ball fields and all of those kinds of things. Um, because we wanted to make sure that the people that use that park um, are safe. When it gets into some of the other parts of the, of the property, that's where we need, I think, to do a little bit more work or a lot more work to figure out just what exists there. So your point's well taken. That's all right. Um, as a former environmental professional, I'm curious to know what remedial actions took place in the 80s. I know the EPA was really young. Uh, everything was getting found out. Was the site excavated and so soil hauled off site and treated? Um, I saw, there was an open pond in the one photo. What actions were taken at that time? Um, I know with modern remediation, brownfield sites and such, there is a requirement to excavate down to a certain point before you can start putting a cap. And often there's a barrier installed um, or either a, a plastic barrier or a clay barrier to prevent things from traveling upward into the soil profile. 
Um, just curious to know what documentation there is of what the actions were at that time, and if that was all in the remedial action plan, that would be helpful to know, I think, for her question. Nabil, is that, is that something you could help with? Yeah, I mean, we, we, when we completed the, the remedy at the site, we have what we call a construction completion report that kind of document that will document the work that we've done at the site. At this particular site, we have uh, a million a cubic yard of uh, contaminated soil that it was determined it's impractical and, and not feasible to excavate and ship that off site. So it's, it's as protective to have it uh, uh, capped and then address the water issue in the same fashion that we have been addressing it over the last 30 years. Uh, that will eliminate the, the, the exposure uh, risk associated with the site. So uh, the only, uh, uh, as far as uh, shipping and disposal of, of uh, impacted material, over the years, the city did some work at the park, and then sometime when the city excavated work and they encountered material, that material was shipped off-site. But I think for the original remedy, the remedy was to cap these impacted area with clean soil and establish a healthy vegetation and then address the groundwater concern uh, that uh, as time went on. And to go back to the, 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 the three inches scenario of the cab, uh, if you have a three inches of clean soil and then you have a parking lot or a pavement or a sidewalk over it, that area is pretty much stable as far as we are concerned. There will be no uh, exposure associated with that portion. Go ahead, thank you. Hi, I have another question. Um, sorry, I didn't realize protocol said you should stand up, so I apologize. Um, you can sit down, you don't have to stand okay, up. Okay, well now I'm standing, so. <laughs> um, so I live on the site, uh, the 3300 on the park condominiums. And um, my child was born there, he's four. And I'm really starting to understand the meaning of ignorance is bliss. I kind of wish I didn't know these things now. Um, so I remember you saying there is no unacceptable risk at the site, but is there a risk? Is my child, am I at risk versus someone who does not live at this site? We are out in that park every day playing. We are in the woods every day playing. We are rolling around. We are digging in the dirt. We may illegally be growing things in our backyard um, and eating them, you know, and now I'm, I'm worried, like, what have I been doing to my child? And I think um, another thing, I'm sorry, this may be a two-part question, but how did I not know about this before? How did I not know this when I bought my condominium? I mean, why is there no disclosure? And I'm, sh I'm making a huge assumption, but I'm assuming my neighbors in the rental units probably have no idea about this. I, I feel um, angry that nowhere was that disclosed? I mean, I mean, like now, if I go to buy a home someday, my question will be, is this site contaminated? I mean, the idea that that was not disclosed at any point of the process in buying a condominium there is really quite alarming to me. Um, and yeah, I guess I, I need to go back to that. There is no unacceptable risk, but is there risk? Bill, you want to handle that one? Please speak up here, Nabil, if you can. Based on the investigation that we did, uh, of course, uh, the way we do work, we look, we look at the risk and the risk range. And when I say there is no unacceptable risk, there may be, uh, there, there is uh, risk available, however, it's below the threshold that we have. And again, when the number that was mentioned, if you, when do you determine uh, if there is a risk and if you have one uh, cancer in, in 100,000, this is one to the 10 to the minus four risk, this is when the EPA will step up uh, and, and do work and address that issue. So. When I say there is no unacceptable risk, there is a risk that's below our threshold that we do not consider. It's, it's, it's gonna adversely impact the population and human health. There is not, I, I cannot say there is zero risk, especially when I talk to 
uh, the vapor intrusion issue. We identified risk, however, it was below our actual level. It was, you know, based on the study and the risk numbers that we have, it's an acceptable risk. It did not exceed a threshold where we have to step in and do something about it. Yes, ma'am. I just was wondering where the contaminated soil went to. Was it sent somewhere where it's right. contaminating someone else? No, the, any contaminated soil that we would have hauled off site, for example, as a part of the park project, uh, would have to go to a landfill that is designated for accepting material like that. So um, uh, we're just not dumping it anywhere out there for anybody who might want some fill. It has. To, it has to go to a, a uh, facility that can handle uh, or is built to uh, a store material like that. I think a lot of it gets burned up. Pardon me? I think a lot of it gets burned and figure out where That could be. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what they might do with it, but no, we can't just uh, send it off and distribute it anywhere. Um, there are obviously rules and regulations by the agencies um, for any project, anywhere, if there's contamination and the soil is hauled off site, it has to go to a designated facility. Uh, my name is Phyllis McQuaid, and uh, as they told you, I was the mayor. And as a matter of fact, when I was elected in 1982, or 78, it, I was in at the beginning of all of this controversy. In fact, when I was campaigning, it was probably one of the biggest subjects that came up, and I knew nothing. I couldn't answer any of the questions because there had been no studies done we just barely had begun to learn what was happening to the Riley Tarn chemical site and what would be the future for St. Louis Park. And I was very, very proud of what our city staff did then. They took cameras and went down into, lowered them into the wells, and we went to Washington and showed those people what had happened to our city. And we came home with bucks, lots of bucks, from the Superfund. So I guess what I'd like to say to the ladies who have spoken here tonight, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but my husband and our, my eight children we raised here in St. Louis Park since 1961, I wouldn't live anywhere else. But I wonder sometimes when we have these fears of cancer, and I don't take anything away from what you're saying, but what do the people in Edina and Hopkins and Golden Valley, who are they blaming for their cancer patients? Do, how, well is, how well is their water tested? I don't know the answers to that, but I am so proud of what St. Louis Park has done and is continuing to do. So for anybody who questions w whether they should live here or not, I say, boy, you can't find it much better anywhere. Thank one, you, folks. One additional comment. This was a bad site, folks. There was no question about that. In 1979, 80, 81, this was really bad. We were the number one Superfund site for a reason. And where you see that apartment building on the south end of the, at highway, on Highway 7 in Louisiana, that was a wetland. And that's where all the creosote, a lot of the creosote ran. That area south of there is still called Skunk Hollow by the old timers. So when you, drive, when you drove down Highway 7 in the 60s and 70s, that smell permeated the atmosphere for a long way. So it was a bad site, and I agree with Phyllis. When we were doing this back in the 80s, we were, we were breaking new ground. We didn't have, in fact, I still remember about six months after I was here and this was confronting it, 
they always do a recruitment profile for city manager. And I went back and read that profile. And did they say anything about this when I decided to apply for this job? And there was one sentence in there. There was, there was some issue with the water in St. Louis Park. And that's all that was said. And there I was. But I still remember Phil Weber and his dad, Ben, came in when they were building the Park Tavern, which sat, what now sits on the O'Reilly Tar site, in case you didn't know that, coming in and telling me how bad the soils were. They had walls that were bending, and they wanted the city to do something about it. And I said, as far as I know, you bought it as is. We're not going to go into another lawsuit. And they accepted that, and I think Phil's doing pretty well at the Park Tavern these days. But I actually, at one time, was really trying to work against any more construction on this site. And I sat in the third floor conference room here at City Hall and drew up a nine-hole executive golf course that I thought should go on that site, using the pond, which is lined, by the way, using the pond and hit over that for one of the holes. And the then separate HRA handed me my notebook and my drawing and told me to get out of the room. So that nine-hole course never happened. But the city did decide when I was on the council to make this officially a park Correct. and not subject to any more development. So nothing else is going to be built on there. I don't know what they found when they did the foundation for 3300, but I'm sure they hauled all that off the site. They had to at the time. So I think it's safe. Is everything safe? I still maintain you can go out here on Minnetonka Boulevard and suck up about as much PAH as you want for your lifetime, just as much as drinking two glasses of water a day. It's safer to drink two glasses of water a day. It really is. There's a question in back, Jackie. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I am thinking about that plume and the way that it was described that they're pumping it up. And I'm wanting to know if there's still, uh, when the water comes down from rain and snow and it goes through, being that it's not capped, but with clay or anything, that means that the water is going down through all the soil again into the aquifer. And I wanted to find out if that plume still exists and um, if you're able to um, contain it and like if it you have to keep it pumping at a certain amount, I'm trying to understand, so that it doesn't go into the neighboring communities and into Minneapolis. So um, that's my question. Well, the plume does exist. Um, and based on a lot of analysis that's been done here in the last few years, um, there's evidence to, to uh, uh, suggest that it's actually shrunk. So over 30 years worth of time, uh, there's some natural attenuation, some natural uh, treatment, so to speak, but perhaps even more so, or likely more so, is the pumping of the water, the treating of the water, and then the use of the water. So the plume does exist, um, and and uh, the city is responsible for make, uh, uh, pumping that water to make sure it doesn't extend into any other cities, and it has not, uh, which is a great thing. Um, as for um, um, rain falling on the site, you had brought that up, and perhaps percolating down into the soil. I, I am not, uh, that is beyond my pay grade. I don't know if somebody else wants to answer that question, because I, I don't know how to answer that. So I'm looking at PCA, or MDH, uh, or Mark. <laughs> so, do you remember the slide I had up of all the aquifers, the separate layers? So the reason they're called, we differentiate them as separate aquifers, is there's called confining layers in between them, or clay layers, almost like a plastic liner, right? It, it prevents water flow vertically. And if you recall during my portion of the presentation, I mentioned the fact that one of the problems associated with the site that allowed some of the transfer to happen vertically was all those abandoned wells back from when that site was operated as uh, Minnesota Sugar Beets or whatever that company was named, where they had drilled all these extra wells for their own water, to meet their own water requirements. Those wells, to our knowledge, have all been identified and sealed. Um, other wells that are within that site that um, are still in existence for monitoring purposes, they've been rebuilt such that they only pull water from certain aquifer levels so that we can monitor specific to that aquifer. So what that means is any contaminant that might possibly still be filtering down uh, through the soil is going to get trapped in that aqua upper aquifer that is then 
hold because we have gradient control in more than just the drinking water aquifer. We also have gradient control in those upper aquifers, and that has been pulled and captured over the years. Um, I mentioned the successes of the site. Here's another exciting point. Um, the data that has been monitored over those 30 years has shown, and all of the agencies have agreed that the data has shown, that the, the revised monitoring has shown, um, uh, not monitoring, but the revised modeling. So there's two things. There's the data from the monitoring, and then there's the data from the modeling. So monitoring means the contaminant level. Modeling means where the groundwater goes. And from using those two data sources, we've been able to come up with a plan, a pilot study that says, let's look at shutting off the gradient control in those upper aquifers because it has reduced to the point that what's called monitored natural attenuation is the best way to go moving forward. So it's just a pilot study, and we did that on purpose because we want to make sure it's the safe move moving forward. So for the next three years, those wells, those upper aquifer wells are going to be shut off so we can monitor what happens to that water. Now, for those in the room, I believe I have enough copies. Uh, before we leave for today, I will put out uh, one of the tables, uh, a little packet. It's a three-page packet that contains my presentation. Um, oh, shoot, I didn't include it. But if you leave, I have a couple copies, not enough for everyone in the room, but I do have a couple copies that show all the wells that, have mo that are monitored. And you will see that we monitor way beyond the limits of the Riley site and even beyond the limits of St. Louis Park. We, we monitor, we work with Edina um, to monitor some of their wells because we care that much about understanding Hopkins, to, to about understanding what is happening with that groundwater flow. So we're, we're doing our best to understand and then react accordingly uh, in a, a health and human safety and environment, environmentally conscious way. Hi, my name is Fatuma Irshad, and I live uh, in St. Louis Park about 14 years now. I had no idea about this, so I appreciate this, you doing this tonight, because I've learned a lot. And <laughs> so I appreciate the information, because I had no idea about all this history. But um, for me, without even this knowledge, I used to prefer just buying water, drinking water from the stores. So I never drink water from the tap, but I used to use for cooking and all that mm -hmm. until I have my kid. And then when she yeah. was a baby newborn, the doctor said, do you guys drink from the tap, the tap water, what do you drink? And I said, we buy drinking water from the store. And he said, you, you're wasting your money. Like if you're rich and you have all this money to just like, you know, throw away you don't need to buy water, you just need uh, to drink from the tub, and it's actually good for the kids, uh, you're giving them straight from the tub. So you, when you go to the dentist, that's what they say. And so we started using, uh, drinking the tap water, and now that I'm hearing this, you know, there's a chance that even though you say it's low than threshold, that it's a safe drinking water, but I can still hear that there's a um, chance, you know, that they might not be completely, the water might not completely be safe to drink. And I'm concerned that. And then also I have seen a couple times the water in my home, like they change colors. Like I've seen that two times and I didn't know what to make that. So when I turn the water on, they, they're red or kind of orange. And I, I'm nervous and I'm, I don't know. And so I always have this lingering questions, sure. is this safe? What is this? Why are they changing? The water is changing color. So I just want to know if uh, I want you guys to be honest with residents. So if this water is even like, if, if there's a small, small chance that it's unsafe to drink, so we know that we make our, our own decision. Well, I think uh, I'll just give you a, a big picture answer. And then I think I am going to need to invite somebody from the Department of Health to come up. Um, as the agency that makes sure the water that comes out of your tap is safe to drink. What I can say is the water in St. Louis Park is just as safe 
just as safe to drink as it is in Edina or Hopkins or Golden Valley or Bloomington or any other city uh, uh, here in Minnesota or in the metro area where there's a municipal system because that's what the Department of Health requires, that the drinking water is safe. So um, your water, the water is, is, is held to the same, the water that we pump and provide you is held to the same standards as every other city here uh, in a metro area, for example. So I would not hesitate to drink it because of a concern about uh, some health concern with what's in the water. And uh, we're required um, to, uh, or the Department of, ha uh, Department of Health does testing of all cities, not just us, um, to make sure that the water does meet um, drinking water standards. Um, and I think I'd invite somebody from the Department of Health to come up to answer that versus taking my word for it, so. Yeah. Um. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, I, 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 I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. What you're seeing in that water is iron. Uh, the water that we pump out of the groundwater has uh, you know, a high iron concentration in it. So what happens is um, if we're doing, for example, a uh, water main flushing exercise, which we do in the spring and fall, that kind of stirs up the iron that's in the pipes uh, underground that serves the community. And, and uh, that can result in um, the water that comes out of your tap uh, looking orange or kind of reddish. That's what that is. That's, those are iron deposits. Um, and that's, while it may look funny or maybe affect the taste a little bit, it's not something that you need to be concerned about. It can discolor your, your laundry, and we have some tips for how to deal with that. But uh, from a drinking water quality perspective, it's fine. The bill? When we talked about the risk that we have at the site that's below the uh, threshold as far as the risk is concerned, uh, what I meant what was uh, based on the vapor intrusion study that we did, based on the gases that comes out from the soil or come out from the contaminated groundwater, uh, I, I did not mean that it's the water that we are drinking has any risk whatsoever. It's only, I was referencing to gases from the associated with soil and uh, groundwater, and also, there's a construction worker that goes to the park and, and, and dig below uh, the, the cab and do some construction work. There is a risk associated with that kind of exposure. Uh, as far as we know, and based on all the testing that we did, and the state is, is involved in monitoring that, uh, groundwater is not, there is, there is no risk associated with the groundwater whatsoever. It's safe to say it's almost Thank zero. Thank you, Bill. So we have a representative of the Minnesota Department of Health who can um, help answer your question as well. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Brian Noma and I work for the Minnesota uh, Department of Health. I'm the field engineer that covers St. Louis Park. And um, to let you know that this water is tested quite extensively and it does meet the Safe Drinking Water Act, which all communities are required to meet. So, you know, I, I, when you talk about bottled water, there are bottled waters that aren't tested nearly as much as this tap water is. So when you buy bottled water, sometimes you're not really sure what you're getting because it might not be tested to the same extent. But St. Louis Park does provide you with a consumer confidence report every year. And it, the consumer confidence report is designed to let the community know what is in their drinking water, um, if they've had any violations, if any, which they haven't. Um, anything that they may have found in the water at certain levels um, might be below thresholds, but they will let you know that in their CCR. Thank you very much. You're Did you have a follow-up question on that at all, ma'am? Okay. We have a gentleman right here. Hi. Uh, hello? You're on. I can hear you. Um, I have a question about the um, financing of mm -hmm. this of this water treatment. Um, originally, there was Riley Clark Parent Chemicals involved. Are they still going to be involved in the financing? Or generally speaking, how is the financing going to be done? Uh, when you're speaking to financing, I 
think you're speaking to the cost of implementing the, the pumping and treating and all of those kinds yes. of things, that $500,000 number that we mentioned earlier. Um, where that money comes from are the uh, water users in St. Louis Park. So um, if you receive a water bill, a utility bill from the city, part of your utility bill um, goes to uh, running the system in general in the community, but also to uh, uh, all of the requirements we have to meet under the consent decree existing and in the future uh, when it comes to testing. So everybody in the community that uses water and pays a utility bill is helping to pay that $500,000 cost. Not Riley. Not Riley, no. In fact, um, and we can talk about this offline if, you, if you'd like, Riley and their, the subsequent owner of Riley has um, filed for bankruptcy and basically all of their obligations um, relative to the site have been um, dismissed, I guess is the word to use. So it's really the city that um, uh, will continue to uh, take the measures that are required and quite candidly other than um, the original plants that they built, Riley has not had a whole much, has not had a whole lot to do with the site. It's really been the city and the agencies that have have uh, made it work. All right, I think um, what I uh, maybe we wrap up the uh, uh, questions uh, in this format, but I want to let you know that <clears throat> city staff uh, is going to remain, and all of the agency staff are going to remain. So if you have specific questions you want to ask, they have information in the back of the room, we would be happy to stay here and answer any questions you, uh, that you might have. So thank you again for coming. Thanks to those that are watching tonight. And um, uh, we'll probably be talking soon. Thanks. <laughs>